inspirational venture. The inspirational venture organized jointly by Institute of Science Mumbai and Institute of Science Aurangabad. Microbiotalk stands as a dynamic platform that bridges the gap between aspiring microbiologists, seasoned professionals, and the ever-evolving ever world of microbiology. This innovative initiative, available both online and in face-to-face -face format, is designed to illuminate the pathways of success through inspiring talks delivered by accomplished microbiologists. In the Morning. In the realm of science, particularly with the intricate field of microbiology, the journey of discovery can often seem complex and daunting. Microbi Microbiotalk aims to demystify this journey by offering a series of engaging lectures and interactive sessions that provide invaluable insights in the world of microbes, health science, and in the broader spectrum of life sciences. So these talks, which are carefully curated to showcase a diverse array of perspectives and experiences, source of inspiration for students and educators also. Whether you are a budding microbiologist eager to explore the countless opportunities in the field holds uh, or an experienced educator seeking to infuse fresh perspectives in their curriculum, the Microbiotalk offers a platform for shared learning and growth. So it is, uh, it is bringing together the students, educators, as well as the professionals. So for students, the talk provides window into the real world application of microbiology, offering glimpses of how scientific theories are transformed into impactful innovations. Seasoned microbiologists, they share their stories, they share their challenges, breakthroughs, and the evolution of their career, uh, instilling a sense of perseverance and resilience in the next generation of scientists. Educators, on the hand, they gain access to the repository of fresh ideas and approaches to teaching in microbiology. So whether you are a student yearning for knowledge or an educator seeking inspiration, Microbiotalk invites you to be a part of transformative journey into the captivating world of microbiology. So today we have a very distinguished speaker amongst us. Let me introduce him. Respected directors of Institute of Science Mumbai and Aurangabad, distinguished faculties and fellow student enthusiasts of scientific exploration. It is both an honor and privilege to introduce our esteemed speaker for today's event. With a profound dedication to advancing the frontiers of knowledge and a remarkable career spanning across some of the NASA's most cutting edge research centers, allow me to introduce Dr. Parag Vaishampayan a true luminary in the realms of bio space biosciences. Currently serving as the acting division chief, chief for the space biosciences division at NASA's Ames Research Center in the heart of California's Silicon Valley, Dr. Parag influ Dr. Parag's influence on our understanding of how space, space flight impacts living systems is nothing short of profound. His expertise has been a guiding light for over 70 active space biology projects, where he has diligently unraveled the intricacies of how life responds to the challenges of space, both in simulated ground-based experiments and aboard the International Space Station. Prior to his tenure, uh, tenure at Ames, Parag's journey through scientific exploration led him to the renowned NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he played a pivotal role in safeguarding the integrity of our celestial investigations. His contributions to planetary protection, implementation for numerous NASA's missions, including MSL, InSight, and SIGHT, underscore his commitment to ensuring that our quest for knowledge doesn't inadvertently disturb the delicate balance of extraterrestrial environment. Parag Vaishampayan's impact extends far beyond the terrestrial realm as demonstrated by his more than 60 peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, and a plethora of presentations. His ingenious work has yielded a novel molecular approaches, instruments, and bioinformatic analysis tools that have become foundational resources for microbial ecologists worldwide. A recipient of numerous prestigious accolades, including NASA's Exceptional Public Service Medal, the JPL Explorer Award, the Voyager Award, and the Mariners Award, Dr. Parag's dedication to advancing our understanding of the universe knows no bounds. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it is with immense admiration that I present Dr. Parag Venshampayan, a trailblazer in space biology. Please join me 
in welcoming a true visionary and leader in scientific exploration. Thank you. Over to you, Parag. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I hope I'm audible and visible. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, I will take this opportunity to thank uh, all the organizers, including Dr. Peshwa for giving this opportunity and all others uh, who have worked before for organizing this talk. And thank you all who are joining. And I see the number is increasing. More and more students are checking in. So it's always a pleasure to talk with students. Um, so give me one second where I can share my screen and we will start the presentation. So let me know when you see my presentation. Do you see the slides or? Yes, sir. You see the slides? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and is it in a full screen mode or in a non presentation mode? Can someone confirm if it's a full screen mode? No, sir. How about now? Yes, it is. Okay, good. And just want to confirm that. Okay, okay. Um, great. Let me start the talk by first of all thanking you all. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Prag Vashampayan. I'm the acting space biology, space biosciences uh, division chief. I used to be space biology portfolio scientist. Um, and today I'll be talking about career options in space biosciences research. So most of you, I believe you are a microbiologist. And as a microbiologist, mostly we think about uh, career options in food microbiology, pharmaceutical microbiology, or in academia or in industry. But very rarely we might think that microbiologists can actually play, play a role in space biology or space science or to work for NASA or for ISRO for that matter. Uh, the way I would like to design my talk is I will talk about my research career and my research journey. You will get some glimpse about how one can progress their career in So let me begin my talk by first of all congratulating the team ISRO for not only done a soft landing of the lander, but they have also uh, now have a rover which is marching along on the lunar surface. And uh, India became the first country landing on the south pole of moon. And so it's my immense pleasure. I started my journey and my career working with ISRO. So I'll talk about that, but uh, let me congratulate to everybody there in ISRO who are working and all my Indian uh, colleagues and fellows. So I started my journey as a budding microbiologist. So just, just to give you a quick background on my career, uh, I did my master's from Mumbai University, from Hopkins Research Institute. So I used to work in Hopkins Research Institute. Um, I moved to Pune, where in Agartha Research Institute, I did my PhD. My PhD was in uh, phytoremediation. So I looked into the plant microbial interaction for removing uh, organic chlorine molecule called atrazine from the soil. So little bit one step back when I was doing masters, I did an internship in Cancer Research Institute in Mumbai and where I was part of the team which developed the first ELISA kit for HIV. So back then, all the HIV kits used to come from either from Europe or from USA. And as you all know, HIV, HIV virus is constantly changing its surface protein. So some of the proteins which are non-specific to Indian patients, they were not matching with those ELISA kits. So I was very fortunate as a budding
while I just doing my master's, I was part of the team and the market. So I always thought that I'll be a virologist all my life and I'll be doing the uh, HIV research, but fate had different uh, thing planned in my, uh, in my fate. So I moved to Pune, did my PhD. And before I was about to defend my thesis, I had some time uh, and I didn't know that where I will go after my PhD and do the postdoc. So in between that period, I wrote a proposal to DBT and I uh, got the funding. I started working in National Center for Cell Sciences. So National, Sen National Center for Cell Sciences, those who know in Pune is on the Pune University campus and Ayuka is also next door. So Dr. Jayant Narilkar, one of the eminent astrophysicists in India and worldwide. Uh, he was retired back then. He established Ayuka, Ayuka, as you all probably know, but he was still there and he was still working. I mean, even though he retired, he was still working in the Institute and he had a theory or he was working on a project called Panspermia, as you can see here. And I will talk more about panspermia, but the reason he was interested in panspermia, because when he was a postdoc in UK, he was working with Dr. Fred Hoy. And Dr. Fred Hoy, we proposed the whole panspermia or lithopanspermia. And the theory basically says that, as you can see in this molecules picture, life exists throughout the universe and life can travel between the planets as you can see here, in forms of precursors of molecules or molecules or some kind of microorganisms and life transfer between the planets. And whenever it finds the right environment, it starts growing and pro proliferating and evolving. So Fred Hoyle and Dr. Narayikar thought if it's true and that has happened millions of years back and that's how life has evolved on Earth. And the reason we, we believe that that might have happened is because as you can see here on the top right picture approximately 2.5 billion years after the earth came into existence it got bombarded with hundreds and thousands of meteorites every day that period is called late heavy bombardment so during the late heavy bombardment even if any life would have formed before that would have been wiped out from the surface of the earth. So that means life has to restart after that late heavy bombardment phase. And the latest microbial fossilized microbial evidence we know is somewhere around 2.9 to 3.5 billion years. So if that's true, there is a very short window for life to evolve on earth. And that led to a, a hypothesis that maybe we might have got some help from outside. And that help from outside could be in forms of precursors or some molecules coming out from other planets. And the only way it can come is through meteorites or cosmic dust. And as you all know, we get bombarded with cosmic dust every day, even, even every night. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's night here in California. So if you just go outside, you, you will see that there, is, there are some meteorites, some asteroids are always coming in. So Dr. Narayikar thought, why can't we actually go above atmosphere, which is stratosphere, and collect some air samples from the stratosphere and those bring those samples back and then we can reanalyze those samples and look for any form of microorganisms in there. So it, it was a fantastic idea. Um, just one step bef behind that, there were, fact the researchers from US, they found a meteorite, a uh, very famous meteorite called ALH84001. This was found in Antarctica, as some of you might have seen this meteorite, and we this meteorite came from Mars. So we know that it is a Martian meteorite, but some of the researchers whom I know, they took the thin section of these rock samples and they found something like this. As you can see here, these are, they thought that these are fossilized or some form of microorganisms. And that became a worldwide news. Everybody thought that we found the first evidence of first life from Mars. And that was a big thing for, for panspermia. And everybody thought that this was a clear evidence for panspermia. But later on, this whole um, thesis was debunked. People thought that that's not true. But Dr. Narikar worked with ISRO and ISRO launched these air sampling balloons from Hyderabad. And we went back to Hyderabad and collected those samples when those samples came back on Earth. So the idea is we had some capsules which are stored at 
on Earth and some capsules which were launched in the space. We collected some samples, brought it back, and I did analyze those samples. And to our surprise, we actually found some microorganisms in those samples. Now, we don't know whether those samples really came from extraterrestrial uh, bodies or it could be super cosmic uh, phenomenon happening on Earth. We might have lifted the dust or solid up in the atmosphere. Um, I'm getting lost in the background. Thank you. Um, yeah, somebody has an open mic. Thank you. Uh, so when we got back, we found some microorganisms. And most of you microbiologists, you know that if you find a novel microorganism, you can actually name it on your um, on your own. So Dr. Narikar suggested me that we should name it as after his supervisor or after Hoyle, uh, Fred Hoy, and that's the reason we named it as Jani Vector Hoy. Um, I was working with Dr. Yogesh Shauche back then in, in his lab, Dr. Shauche's lab. So Dr. Shauche named it as Jani Vector Hoy. And we also found a few other bacteria. Uh, Dr. Shivaji from, um, from Hyderabad, he named them as Bacillus Soronensis after Isro, um, Bacillus Arivatai after Arivatta. Can you remind a lot of static things? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that was a time when I got a position in, uh, I got a PhD position in Lawrence Berkeley lab in California. So I had to leave, but we, we published this paper. So I'm very fortunate that I got a chance to actually work with some of the ISRO scientists, uh, including Dr. Narikar. So as you can see here, uh, Dr. Narikar is the last author on this publication and I'm one of the author on that. So Jani Vector Hali was my first finding um, and my first introduction to space biology. And that's where, that's where I started learning about the field of astrobiology. As most of you probably know, the field of astrobiology is looking for how life has evolved on Earth, how, where is the life formed on other planetary bodies, and how life is evolving here on our, our, our Earth. So with these three key objectives, astrobiologists look for life. Okay. Um, but my journey took, a, again, a turn because I came to Lawrence Berkeley lab and that's where I started doing a lot of bioinformatics. So some of you probably know bioinformatics is a field of using the computational data from DNA sequence or RNA sequence and process that data for understanding the biological phenomena. So I never had any experience working with computer or writing computer codes or language but I was part of the Joint Genome Institute, one of the biggest sequencing institute back then, uh, which has actually participated in human genome sequencing and three chromosomes of human, uh, human DNA. So I was fortunate enough to just pick up bioinformatics on my own by learning, reading books, uh, so much so that in 20, 2013, I started my own company doing bioinformatic analysis, but that's again a side turn. So my journey, uh, research journey took quite a turn. Um, I actually started my career as an oceanographer. So when I finished my master's and before I got my PhD, I was at National Institute of Oceanography. And I was doing oceanography. So I thought I'll be doing oceanography all my life, um, but I changed my career again. I became a virologist working in National uh, working in Cancer Research Institute. Then I moved to Dr. Shauche's lab. I started doing gut microbiome. Then again, I shifted and started doing astrobiology work. Then I came to Berkeley. And when I came to Berkeley, I started doing, again, started doing gut microbiome. So I published that paper also. Then uh, something very important thing happened because in back of my mind, I always thought that one day I'll be working for NASA uh, because I had my interaction with ISRO and with, with my, my astrobiology experiments. But you always think that as a, as a foreign national, you cannot work for NASA because you have to be a uh, US citizen, which is not the case. Um, and I, I, I want to reiterate that very uh, importantly. People with all, almost all nationalities with 
all kinds of visas they actually work in nasa okay so if ever tells you that you have to be a US citizen, that's not true because I joined as an Indian national. Uh, that opportunity came in 2008 and there is a story behind it. So I just want to show this picture. As you can see here, this laboratory is called Jet Proportion Laboratory. And many of you probably know JPL or Jet Proportion Laboratory because of the movie called Martian. Uh, so Matt Damon is an astronaut uh, role he's playing in that and he gets on Mars and all the missions are going from JPL to JPL become world famous. And of course, JPL is world famous because the first US satellite called Explorer 1 was built in JPL. So in 2007, I saw an opportunity that there is a postdoc opportunity at JPL. And many of you, if you probably know, JPL is managed by Caltech. So it's a Caltech opportunity. When I applied, I looked into the opportunity, I saw that it's only for US citizens. And I, I thought I should not apply because it's only for US citizens. But then I thought if I don't apply, I will never get that job. So why don't I try and see what happens? So I applied and to my surprise, they actually changed the requirements because they like my, most likely they like my CV, but they changed the requirement and I got the position. And so 2008, I joined, uh, Jet Proportion Laboratory as a Caltech employee. And since 2008 until 2020, I was working at JPL. So in JPL, my job was planetary protection. So here is my first um, introduction to planetary protection. And most of you, when you hear about planetary protection, you might think about men in black or people protecting different planets, but that's not the case. Uh, planetary protection is really about maintaining the cleanliness when we build the space craft. so when we build the spacecraft they have to be built in extremely clean environment and you have to also assist the microbial bio burden on the entire spacecraft right from the beginning until launch so when you when you actually land on other planetary bodies you don't end up contaminating the other planetary bodies by bringing any terrestrial microorganisms along with you that is called forward contamination but at the same time, when you bring any samples back from, or if you bring any samples back from other planetary bodies, you don't want to contaminate our own Earth because that's the only planet we live here on, right? So that is called back contamination. So my job at JPL was to ensure that when we are sending any spacecraft to other planetary bodies like Mars, we want to make sure that the spacecraft is clean enough that the probability of contamination should be zero or even below zero. So I was fortunate enough that I was actually swabbing, taking samples of entire spacecraft as we build it. And I was fortunate enough that I worked on the last four Mars missions, including Mars, Mars Science Laboratory, MSL, Inside, which was a lander, and then M2020, Mars 2020, or famously known as Perseverance. So I worked on all these missions from almost from the beginning and collected all the samples. So when you collect the samples, as I mentioned, you always find novel microorganisms. So we, we found so many different kinds of microorganisms and we get a chance to name those. So I have on my credit close to a dozen or more microorganisms we have named them after and my team my lab has even submitted far more than microorganisms so we have named it after uh, dr abdul kalam we have named it after kalpana chawla and we have named of course we named it after uh, different spacecraft including like phoenix as you can see here this is a very interesting microorganism i found this microorganism only in jpl clean room and another clean room in french guiana and so that's the reason we call it as the, even it was a genus was also novel. So we, we named it as Tersicocus. Tersis stands for clean and Phoenixes is because we found it during when we were building the Phoenix spacecraft. And that's why it's known as Tersicocus Phoenixes. So it, 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 it was a amazing experience working with all these microorganisms. But once in a while you find something very special, a very interesting microorganism. And one of that microorganism is called Bacillus pumilus, Sapphire 32. Um, this particular microorganism 
is extremely resistant to heat, is extremely resistant to radiation, extremely resistant to desiccation. So we thought, hmm, if it's so resistant, what if we actually take the micro, this particular bug or microorganism and take it all the way up to the space station and expose it to the space station uh, and bring it back, whether it will and we didn't bring it inside the space station, but we actually took it outside the space station. As you can see here in the circle, we mounted it outside the space station in, in these box and the box has small disc. And on each disc, we had spores of Bacillus fumilis. And we mounted and left it outside space station for 18 months. So for 18 months, it was revolving around Earth in low Earth orbit on the space station it was exposed to all the cosmic galactic UV gamma radiations. And when we brought it back, it was very surprising that all the microorganisms which are on the top surface uh, in that box, almost all except very few, they got killed. So 99.99% of the microbes, they got killed. But we put some discs just bit underneath, which are protected by the top layer. And as you can do that, it is called shielding effect. So if you create the shielding effect, they almost survive as if nothing has happened. So that underlines the importance that when you're building a spacecraft and you're sending the spacecraft to other planets like Mars, some microbes might be hiding underneath or they get shadowed and all those shadowed microbes could survive the space condition. And that's the reason doing the planet protection is so important. Along with my planet protection, I was always interested in understanding how microbes survive in these extreme environments because my career started as a microbiologist. I always had that microbiology interest. And with that microbiology interest, I got a chance to travel all around the world. And my specific interest was looking at microbes surviving in extreme high temperature or extreme conditions. So as you, as you can see here, we went to Iceland and collecting Icelandic hot spring samples. We went to hydrothermal vent samples. So we went deep under the ocean and actually collected the sample where the temperature is of the black smokers is around 300 degrees Celsius. And you can see the life is completely thriving around those black smokers, even if it's so extremely hot, extreme high pressure, life still survived there. Uh, we went to hot springs in New Zealand. So I was in New Zealand collecting the samples there. Then we went to Venezuela on top of the mountains. There are caves inside the caves. Life is evolving for millions of years on its own. So we went inside. The third one is we went deep, 1.1 kilometer deep underground in the cave. There is a potash mine. So we were actually living inside the potash mine and collecting the samples from there. And last but not the least, um, I had a privilege of actually sending projects and samples and working with researchers doing research inside and outside International Space Station. So I'll talk about International Space Station or ISS work, which is what I'm doing right now. So it's been a fantastic journey being a oceanographer, virologist, microbial ecologist, bioinformatician, astrobiologist, and now space biologist. So why do we study these microbes in different environments, right? Um, does it have any effect on us? And yes, it, it does, because we humans, we spend more than 90% of our time in some or other built environment, whether it's a house like this or a college where you guys are sitting or a classroom or a hospital, we always are inside some built environment. And this built environment has its own microorganisms or own microbiology, own microbiota, and we share those microbes, right? So eventually, if we go and live on other planets, like we are going to moon, on Artemis mission or we go to Mars or we live inside the ISS, we will be sharing these microorganisms and how that affects our body. So that's very important to study that. So I will I will end my planetary protection talk by and switch the gears before that. I'll give you one success story. So we had a program in JPL called JPL Medical Engineering Program where we used to invite researchers from other research interests and see if we can have any crosstalk, see if we, if we can find any uh, research collaboration. So we had two researchers coming from a medical research background and they were working on breast cancer. So breast cancer has nothing to do with the research I was doing, but I quickly understood that they are trying to understand 
the links between microorganisms and breast cancer. And they had a hard time connecting those links, looking at the microorganisms. And I said, hey, you know what? I'm actually looking at microbes on the spacecraft in extremely low number. And I have developed some tools and techniques, bioinformatic techniques. Why don't we apply those same techniques for breast cancer research? And I'm really happy to report that breast microbiome was never been studied. Even NIH Human Microbiome Project, they studied microorganisms from different body parts, but they actually never studied microbes from brain and microbes from breast and few other organs. And we were the very first people to actually show that presence of microorganisms in breast ductal system. That's where the cancer growth starts. And we have actually shown a positive correlation between microorganisms present in patients treated without cancer history or with cancer history. So it was a baseline uh, study of looking at microbes in breast ductal fluid. So I'm very happy and um, proud that we were actually able to contribute the tools, techniques, and knowledge developed for planetary protection or for space application or application for human research here on Earth for breast cancer. So as I said, I always like to challenge myself. And the reason I'm telling you guys is because it's all it's always important that yourself and try to see if you can go out of your comfort zone and do something very important that you like to do. So for 13, 14 years, I was doing planet protection, astrobiology. I was very comfortable in my lab, but then I thought I'm managing only one lab. I think I have enough experience that I can manage a program or multiple labs or manage multiple institutions. Why don't I look for that? And I started looking for other opportunities. And in 2020, I got a job in NASA Ames here in California. So I became the space biology portfolio scientist. Uh, as a space biology portfolio scientist, my job was to manage science of all the space biology funded projects on International Space Station, as well as uh, simulated experiments here on Earth. And that's, that's when I joined uh, NASA Ames and moved to uh, Bay Area. And here, as you can see, we have a lot of research on low Earth orbit on ISS. We do research on Earth. Now we're going back to Moon and eventually we'll go back to Mars. So I started my, my journey first from Mars, then we back on Earth with ISS and now we're going back to Moon. So I'm going back and forth between these planetary bodies. Um, as you can see here, that's Ames Research Institute, and that's that's where I work. Uh, so it's a fantastic laboratory. It's one of the one of the oldest labs, uh, and we are primarily uh, located here in the Silicon Valley. So we have Google, Facebook, uh, Intel, all these big tech companies around our center. So we are very fortunate to be in in the Bay Area, and one of the key capabilities we have is biological research. So shifting gears on ISS. So let me take you to International Space Station. As you can see, these humans or astronauts are living in a confined space, right? So imagine you are living in that small area and you have to live for six months. So every time you go up in the space, you minimum duration of your flight is six months. Some astronauts have lived for a year or more, slightly more, but the entire environment inside is pretty much here on Earth. You eat, you bath, you sleep, and you do work. So there's an eight hours of shift where you actually work. And these astronauts are enjoying their food. Everything is floating because there is no gravity. There is a microgravity. So everything is floating. You have to eat, you have to sleep um, in that low microgravity environment. But most important thing is all these astronauts are bringing microorganisms along with them on or inside this inside their body. So we are a human microcosm and we're always contributing these microbes to, to that environment. So trying to understand how we are progressing our understanding as we go beyond the lower Earth orbit, there is a huge unknown where we don't know how the space or the space radiation will react on our body. And that's, that's where we are working on. So you can see uh, ISS is pretty low here as, as you compare to the distance from Earth. 
as you go to the moon, been to moon, now we are going back to the moon almost after 50 years. But as you progress, as you go in the deep space and to Mars, there's a lot of unknowns and we don't understand how these space environments will react on our body. And there are five different things we, we would like to understand. One is the space radiation, right? These are the key hazards on biology, which is space radiation. Then you have a social isolation and confinement because we are socially isolated in a confined environment for six months or even longer. Then you have distance from Earth because you are, you are away from Earth. You cannot get the resources or you cannot get the help immediately if you're living in, in that environment. Then the gravity. Of course, when you are on low Earth orbit, there's a microgravity. So very less gravity, you're basically floating around. If you are on moon, on Mars, there will be one third to one sixth of the gravity. So it's a low gravity will definitely take on, on human systems. You also have a hostile close environment. So you have to deal with all these environments such as temperature, pressure, lightning, noise, and the quality of the space. So including all these five hazards, we need to look into human body outside as well as microorganisms living inside and outside and the plant systems because we are trying to grow plants in on ISS. Uh, so we are looking at different body parts at molecular as well as organizational level. So mainly we are looking at uh, bone, cardiovascular, immune system, nutrition, digestion, reproduction, musculoskeleton, because gravity actually affects our bone density. Our bones becomes more brittle, our muscles lose strength if we are living in the microgravity. Our ocular, that means our eyes, they also have um, issues. Whether our microorganisms are in our body, whether they change because of the microgravity and radiation. And of course, how our plants, as well as the microbes living on the plant, they react to the space conditions. So all these things combined together, it's called space biology, okay? So all these elements, understanding the basic fundamental aspects of looking at space effect on these biological system is what we study. And I'm very fortunate that I'm actually helping NASA space biology program to conduct research in um, low Earth orbit as well as here on Earth. So I did that for last two years, and um, one of the key publications we had. Hello, somebody has a mic. Okay, thank you. Um, so in 2019, we actually published 29 research articles, and this was the first time we showed. Okay, can you please mute? Thank you. Uh, for the very first time, we actually showed the effects on these model organisms and we can correlate that to the human system as well. So uh, we published a lot of research articles, a lot of research papers on this. Now, as you know, we are going back to moon and even India has signed uh, the Artemis Accord. So India and many other countries will be part of this Artemis mission. So uh, almost after 50 years, we're going back to moon and we're going there not to come back, but to stay there. So just like International Space Station, we will have an, a space station revolving around moon. It is called Gateway. So we may eventually have a human presence in the Gateway and humans can land on moon and we can have a a moon, a moon habitat, so human can stay on the moon. So we have a lot of unknowns we need to understand. And that's the reason now we are looking at how the moon conditions or surface of the moon will affect the human body. So that's our new frontiers, new, uh, new targets we have for our understanding. So last but not the least, I would like to show something which is very near and dear to my heart is not only just like how I'm doing today, I always like to I always like to pass on this enthusiasm, knowledge, and understanding to the future generation because it's it's our duty as a scientist to make sure that the next generation understand 
the research we have done. And for that, we have done a lot of education and outreach activities. Uh, there is one program called Space World Bound or SWB program. I've been participating in Space World Bound in California since 2011 until 2016. So each year we used to go to go in a desert, which is close to, you know, within California, close to JKL. And we will take a bunch of students with us and we will stay in that arid environment and try to astrobiology experiments. So in 2015, uh, some of our friends from New Zealand, they said, why don't you guys come to New Zealand and you actually conduct an international spaceward bound in New Zealand. So we, we went and lived with Maori people and did some astrobiology experiment. During that trip, um, some of our colleagues, they thought, why don't we do it in India? So 2016, we came to India in Leh, Ladakh area uh, and studied the high altitude, extremely cold environment. Uh, but we had hydrothermal vent or hot springs there. And so 2016, uh, uh, we were there almost like 10 different countries and we were, we, we were living them. I'm very happy to say that that was one of the key highlights in our spaceward bound because it was an amazing experiment and we actually published some papers on that. In 2017, I went to UK and we went 1.1 kilometer deep underground in mine called Bolby Mine. And there's an astrophysics lab and we also established an astrobiology lab underground there and we studied. I'm also very passionate about working with historically black colleges and universities here in, in uh, US. So I have ran uh, specific programs for minority studying institutions as well as historically uh, black colleges and universities for the last four years. And I conducted workshops across US in multiple universities, teaching astrobiology, teaching uh, planet protection and other programs. A couple of years back, I actually designed with the help of one of my colleagues uh, from Pune. Uh, she designed and taught the class and I used to do it online, but we ran the first certi certification course in astrobiology in Pune University from Modern College. So I tried to contribute my, my fair share for the knowledge transfer to the students and even at AIMS, we are running multiple programs. Unfortunately, most of the programs are for US citizens only, but one of the program is called STAR program. And I would like to advertise this program. It's for not only for postdocs, senior researchers, and it's open for everybody. So we, have, we do have participation from India as well. So in the STAR program, we teach scientists how to design and launch your experiment in space. Because you might have good ideas, but you don't know how to launch your experiments in space. And we teach you that. And we had, last year, we had 25 students, uh, 25 participants from eight different countries, including India. So we are running a lot of uh, good programs for students. And again, today, I would really like to thank you for listening for the last 45 minutes to my talk. And I hope I was able to walk you through my research journey as a microbiologist, but contributing to the space science or space research. Um, and if time permits, I have a four minute video, which I would, will, I'll share it at the end. Uh, but with this, I would like to stop and take any questions or any comments you have for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Everyone can ask questions if you have any. Uh, uh, greetings to you, sir. I'm audible to you. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, sir, as you have described your job, like the domain uh, space biosciences research, uh, I would like to know where, uh, uh, whether there are opportunities there in private space exploration, such as uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX. Yes, absolutely. So as you probably know, 
Now, we use some of these commercial companies for launch. Like for example, on space station, we used uh, SpaceX for launching the supply as well as humans to go to space station. Uh, in future, when we will run this Artemis program, we'll actually use Blue Origin, and there are many, many companies, private companies, and we will use them not only for hardware, but also for launching and taking our hardware to the moon. So we work with almost all the space companies, including SpaceX, Blue Origin, uh, Boeing, North, Northam Grumman. Uh, so I, I work very closely with all those companies. And just like NASA, these companies have tremendous job opportunities, career opportunities for microbiologists, biologists, engineers, uh, planetary scientists. Uh, so along with NASA, now there is industry, space industry, and it's booming. In fact, uh, by 2030, we may stop the ISS program and there will be commercial space stations, at least two commercial space, space stations will be revolving around Earth. So eventually we will actually conduct research not on International Space Station because we will stop the program and we will be conducting research on commercial space stations. So we will be working with commercial companies a lot in future. So the future is quite positive and quite bright for commercial companies to do space research and for you guys to get a job or work with these commercial companies. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, thank you, sir. Also, sir, I wanted to ask uh, about, uh, there was a viral reel going on on Instagram where the interviewer asks Elon Musk that uh, as he's planning to establish human settlements on the Mars, the interview, the interview asks him that uh, it is devoid of the atmosphere and how is he planning to create an atmosphere there? Whether Elon Musk, uh, uh, where he responds that uh, there is a popular idea to bombard the poles of the Mars with the uh, nuclear bombs that will heat up the atmosphere and create an atmosphere eventually. So can you please confirm that this approach is uh, like uh, rational? Well, I mean, definitely it's not, uh, not a rational approach because uh, the reason I'm saying that is it's, it's one of the hypotheses, right? Uh, and the whole hypothesis is how we can make these planetary bodies habitable and but that one approach was you can actually take microorganisms with you and seed those microbes and eventually they will start growing and eventually they will produce oxygen and, and you will change the ecosystem and it becomes habitable but that may take thousands or even millions of years right so that's that's a slow approach one of the fastest approach is you disturb the geology and you disturb the planets by bombarding nuclear or some other approach. So that way you can have change in the atmosphere as change. These are extremely drastic approach and the current planetary protection will prevent any kind of these activities where you artificially see these microbes. First of all, I mean, the very important thing is that we have gone to moon, we have gone to Mars and on Mars we have only landed landers and rovers right so we have not came back from mars yet so there is there is no mars return sample so right now the mars 2020 or perseverance is collecting the martian samples and eventually there will be a mission which will go and bring those samples back so until we actually successfully bring those samples back there won't be any human missions by nasa so eventually there will be missions as we have plans uh, which is called moon to Mars, that means we want to go to Moon and then to Mars. But a private company or other nations, they can think about doing it. But again, that it will have serious consequences on other space-faring nations. So if somebody wants to go there and nuke Mars or do something dramatic like that, uh, we'll have to go through a lot of uh, scientific scrutiny. So I don't think so that it's a fantasy idea, but I don't think so that will be a reality in near future. Uh, and has to go through a lot of scientific scrutiny before we do that. So personally, I would I would refrain from doing something like that because we have to preserve 
the, the whole reason we have the planet protection conditions is because we don't know what kind of conditions you have on other planet bodies. So you don't want to disturb, go and disturb until you study them or understand them. Uh, Thank you. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, hello, sir. Myself, Siddhi Chavan. Uh, I'm from uh, Modern College, Vashi. Uh, I'm in the same lab watching your uh, video right now. And uh, it's the same college where you've done your undergraduation program, sir. Uh, yes. Sir, yes. I want to ask you a question. Uh, so what are the lab, normal lab uh, environment is needed for uh, to perform um, space microbiology? Like how can we create a lab environment where we can perform a space microbiology thing, so? Absolutely, good. And really happy to talk to you because I did my bachelor's from the same lab you are sitting in. Uh, so that's where I started my microbiology career. And when I was doing that, I had absolutely no idea that I would land up in NASA or doing you know, the space biology research. So it's, there are two different things, right? One, you can actually launch your experiments in space or you can perform research on Earth by simulating those conditions, right? So if you are seriously interested in space biology, uh, there are different ways you can you can create the micro simulation uh, or simulation conditions for microgravity on Earth. So if you don't have access to space station uh, or launching your experiments on space, which you can do, uh, you can have a lab experiments where you can perform those experiments. Uh, so that's one answer, and that's not that expensive. So you can you, uh, study how you can study how life can survive in extreme extreme high like that. You can study life. Can you please mute? Thank you. Um, Hello, Dr. Parag, are you there? Hello, this is Dr. Peshwe. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes uh, ma'am. I think the resource person has left. I am not able to see him on the screen. So I will share his mail ID with uh, our group so that you can reach out to him. So let me end this program now. I'm proposing the vote of thanks. It is with immense gratitude and a sense of enriched knowledge that we extend our sincere appreciation to Dr. Parag Vaishampayan for gracing us with his enlightening guest lecture. His extensive expertise and remarkable journey have truly inspired us. 
Let us all acknowledge Dr. Vaishampayan's adept management of multi-year, multi-institutional research projects, which highlights his exceptional organizational skills and collaborative spirit. On behalf of everyone present, I would like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Vaishampayan for sharing his profound insights, invaluable experiences, and unwavering dedication to the field of space biology, planetary protection, and scientific exploration. His lecture has illuminated our path towards understanding the cosmos and the intricacies of life beyond, our, beyond our planet. We are truly honored to honored to have the uh, to have had the privilege of listening to Dr. Vaishampayan's guest lecture, and we eagerly anticipate the impact of his wisdom on our ongoing endeavors in the realm of science and exploration. Thank you, Dr. Vaishampayan, for your enlightening lecture and for enriching our understanding of the fascinating intersection between space, biology, and human exploration. Your contributions serve as an inspiration to us all. I take this opportunity to thank Professor Srinivas Kulkarni, Director, Institute of Science, Mumbai, and Professor Rajendra Satpute, Director, Institute of Science, Aurangabad, for his encouragement to organize this scientific event. I thank Professor Ullas Patil, the founder of Microbio Olympiad, which is a venture to popularize the subject amongst the budding macrobiologists for his motivation to organize such inspiring talk. I thank the, uh, I thank Professor Rupendra Jadav and Professor Aniruddha Petkar, the head of the departments of microbiology for their support. So thank you everyone for joining and there are more uh, of these talks coming in future. Thank you so much. Hi, I just joined. Yeah. Uh, Parag, we will share your mail ID uh, with these people so that they can reach out to you. Uh, uh, is that okay? Hello? Dr. Parag, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, can you hear me, Dr. Parag? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, actually, I think you had left the meeting, so I thought uh, I should end this. Uh, why not share your mail ID with these uh, students so that they can reach out to you? Sure. I, I got kicked out from the meeting. I think somebody just <laughs> okay, uh, okay. kicked me okay. out from the meeting. Okay. Yeah, but I was able to join again. Yeah. So uh, uh, can we end can this take... meeting now? Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so uh, if you don't mind, can we share your mail ID uh, to these students? Uh, yeah, I can give you my personal mail ID and then yeah. we can share it. Yes, you can, you can send it to me, then I will share it on the students group so that if they yes. have any queries, they can reach out to you. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so thank you once again uh, for sharing an inspirational uh, talk. Uh, I'm sure many students have uh, must be having many questions in their mind, so uh, they will ask you on uh, on the mail. Okay. Sure thing. Okay. Thank you so much for the Thank opportunity. You. Thank you. So uh, I declare that this uh, session is over now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining.